going to be talking about how you guys can measure your headphones frequency response at home in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> this is a graph that I took at my house. Um, it's a decay plot, but we'll get into that later. Basically, what you'll need is uh, these things here. This is a program called uh, Room Equalization Wizard. It's a free thing you can download online. Um, I can give you guys the links if some of you want to do that. Uh, there's a, an add-on for the output too, it's called M3D Mixer, and it's, uh, I think it's only for Mac, and if you have the new 10.7, you don't even need it. I'll we'll worry about that later. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, don't, um, it's a small issue. Major thing is that Phantom Power Supply, that uh, I sort of went off someone else's design a little bit and found the components that I needed. Uh, so that's something you could do also, sort of. It's a pretty simple thing. Uh, and the 9 volts is for this mic, this Panasonic WM61A capsule mic, which is a pretty well-regarded uh, flat response mic. Some of you may know about it. Uh, some cables here just for hooking things up, and then obviously the headphones that you want to measure. This is the simple schematic of the Phantom Power Supply that I built. And really not much to say about it. It's fairly simple. You just have mics. Uh, the mic is going across the terminals on the left, and on the right is just going to the line in mic port on your laptop. Uh, I got this from a friend, uh, Keith Adkins, that lives in Tennessee. And he got this from another friend who designed a bunch of this stuff. And uh, that friend of his had actually made most of, he, he kind of put together this whole system. So I guess we have to give thing. There you see an eye hole, and all that. Uh, not too much to talk about there. This is the the mic uh, for the calibration. Like I said, it's the Panasonic WM61A, and uh, that's the frequency response of the mic itself. It has a little bit of wavering up in here, and so that's why we make a calibration file in the software that we use uh, to take things like that out of the measurement, so that you're only measuring the headphones and not the other uh, non-linear things. So, uh, also this mic is very small. Uh, see, this is six millimeters. It's like a really tiny thing. You, you stick it in your ear, by the way. This is where you would. Uh, this is the REW program. There's this calibration file. Uh, this calibration file is online. You can download this for free, obviously, and load it into the calibration for the mic in the program. And uh, an important thing to note is that uh, do I have a cursor? Yeah, uh, this C-weighted thing here, this uh, you don't want checked. Um, I don't really want to go into all that right now because it's sort of too much detail, but um, don't check that. Uh, <laughs> but once you have this calibration file loaded in, we can not quite start measuring yet because we still need to calibrate our um, power supply and our amp and our deck because those things may not be flat either. To do this, we basically make a feedback loop and then we take the measurement of that feedback loop and create a calibration file from that. So what that's going to look like is basically like this. You have your audio off from your laptop, which in my case is USB uh, going to the digital analog converter and to the headphone amp. Uh, and you actually route the output of the headphone amp to the power supply input and then that back into the line in port on the laptop. And what you do then is it'll be actually just do this easier so you guys can see this better. Um, so you, you want to calibrate it and this box here is going to tell you, you know, hook it up like this and go through and make sure you have this sound level set. This is where you're going to set the input I think it's calibrating on it's it's calibrating on a single tone, I believe, or perhaps pink pink voice. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna set the level here. Usually minus 12 decibels is good for doing the calibration. And what that's gonna do is uh, your your input level is gonna be here. This bar is kind of coming up dark on the screen, but you'll see the input here, and you have to match your outputs um, the decibel level. Here. So you're going to 
be going into your uh, sound on, well, you have the knob on the amp volume, and you also have the mic's uh, sensitivity or the way it picks up volume that you can change on your computer. And so you'll be adjusting those, that slider or the knob on your amplifier, to basically make sure that all these match, uh, and that way it will be calibrated and you can hit make cal and uh, to create the calibration file. I didn't really put a picture of what the calibration curve would look like, but it's more or less a flat line. It's a roll off at the top and bottom, so it's not really that interesting to look at. Um, this is one way that you can hook up the mic. Basically, you want to put this mic into your ear. The way I have it is slightly different than what's done here, because what this diagram shows is actually to insert the mic, to put the headphone in, on like a chamber measure it that way so you can stick it inside the chamber and have the headphone uh, on the other side of the chamber and it'll read that way. Uh, what I have is the mic is sitting in your ear and there's a, a wire solder to it that comes off and then you have a female uh, RCA, you know, a single mono RCA that you can attach your one of your channels of the male RCA cable that terminates in an 8th inch uh, which will go into your power supply. So you're wearing the microphone in your ear then you, you have your headphone on over that, and that way you can record one channel at a time. To actually take the measurements, um, you're going to basically do this, which is you, you want to connect the mic to the left channel of the RCA, like I was talking about, coming out of your ear. And then that cable that's connected to the mic, you put to the input side of the fan of power supply, and the output goes to the, with a male to male cable, goes to the input line in on your laptop. And then you just hook up your headphones as if you were just going to listen to music the normal way with a DAC amp and then headphones. And uh, you want to be careful the way you have the headphones positioned because uh, if you have a loss of seal or maybe it's scooted down or too high or maybe forward a little bit, it's going to alter the measurements because this isn't a professional neural head. You can't just stick headphones on this thing and get accurate measurements every time. It's um, hard to be very repeatable and accurate. And even from day to day, you might see changes in your measurements just because it isn't repeatable like it might normally have to be. Um, but you know, to try your best and get the most repeatable measurements, it takes practice and also careful placing of the microphone also in your ear. You can't insert it too deep or have it hanging out because uh, that will also change things. So uh, you have to find what works. It's a lot of trouble shooting trial and error, but you know, you'll get it soon enough. So to start the measurement process, first you want to check the level that you're at right here uh, with check levels. And to do that, first we need to set up this little box here. This is just a, this is going to do a frequency sleep when you take the measurement. So you, this is your starting value, uh, frequency, and then your end value. I usually do maybe either something really low, like 2 or 10, something like that, and around 20 or 25. This is the, that level, the sound pressure level in decibels that you'll be sleeping at. Negative 15 is common, negative 12 is also good. Uh, this is the length of the sweep. Uh, you can do 5, 12K for a little longer sweep. And the number of sweeps you want to do per measurement, and then the total time that that sweep will take. So to check the levels, it's basically going to pump uh, pink noise out at whatever this level is here. So you'll see that popping up uh, on this bar here, and you want to turn up the volume on the amp so that your the, the level that the mic is reading is roughly within 5 decibels of what that level is. So if we say, uh, you know, minus 12 decibels here, we want, um, you know, maybe minus 16, minus 17 decibels to work that um, reading from the mic. And once that's okay, we can hit start measuring. And it's going to do the frequency sweep from here to here, uh, which in this case shown as 10 to 20,000 hertz. And it's going to plot a graph. But before we can really look at the graph and make sense of what the heck is going on, uh, we need to make sure it's set up properly. And, and I'll show you an example of how this, you know, the difference of how the graph can look when it's not set up properly. So I found that having the y-axis in about 5 decibel is good. 
if you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty details, you could zoom in to get maybe one or two decibels even. But usually, uh, a difference in even in channels uh, of headphones that you buy at the store might be one or two decibels different in each channel. So you may not even be hearing differences that small. Um, and the x-axis, uh, you know, humans can hear 20 to 20,000 hertz. People say so that is a logical scale to have on the x-axis. And you also want that in a logarithmic scale as well, not straight scale. Uh, most headphone frequency responses are shown in the log scale. Um, the other thing you can set is the offset of the graph, which is where you want that zero decibel line to be. And um, as far as I know, some others may know various ways uh, to really determine where the zero decibel line would be, but my best way has been just to guess where the flattest points are, and that would be your zero decibel line. It's sort of just a reference at this point. So this is an example of a curve that I took of a bad measuring headphone. But at first glance, you might say, well, it looks you know not that bad. It's, uh, it looks fairly flat, especially in your base and your range. Um, and the treble looks sort of characteristic of uh, what might happen in headphones. Um, but when you when you look at it, um, it doesn't matter so much that you're going down very far to 30 hertz. You know, this is sort of there's no point in having this empty space here. But you're you're looking in 20 decibel increments on your y-axis. Um, so when you correct that, there's I mean, <laughs> it's not good. Uh, and and there you see the flaws between the two, from what looks okay to something that looks pretty horrendous. Uh, you see, there's oh, all of a sudden. Is uh, I'm sitting with like maybe a minus 22 decibel uh, trough here in your frequency response, and you've got um, some bass humps here, uh, spike maybe here or so, or it's actually rolling off a little bit there. You, know. you need to make sure that those things are set properly before you start analyzing what's wrong with your frequency response and what needs to be changed. This is just showing. Um, here is where you can set the offset in your controls. When you hover over your graph, you'll have a little magnifying glass you can click plus or minus. Uh, but if you set the limits up there, you can um, change both the maximum minimum of the y-axis and maximum minimum of your x-axis um, to apply to every graph, which is useful. Uh, this is also what the main interface looks like in REW. You've got all your measurements will be stacked up on the left got your, the curve you're looking at on the right, and up here you can change between different graphs. Uh, REW can make lots of different types of graphs, including waterfalls and spectrograms, which are also useful. So, so to see the changes in the frequency response once we've set our limits correctly in the graphs, um, we can start to see changes when you can consistently measure your headphones after you've practiced techniques to make sure that you get consistent measurements all the time. This is an example of some measurements I took yesterday or two days ago. I think it was yesterday. Um, this was the right channel. And there was this really big uh, hump here from sort of mid-base to mid-range, uh, roughly, I don't know, seven, eight, nine decibels, something really bad like that. And I had to put holes in, I had glued the vents in the cup uh, shut because that was what was measuring best with the left channel, but obviously not with the right channel. So I had to make little one millimeter holes, and each of these drops here is showing the difference in frequency response. Uh, and there's a one hole, two holes, three holes, four holes, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so you, it's kind of interesting to see the difference of you know how each one progressively gets maybe better or just different as you go. So I thought that was kind of nice that it was so consistent those changes. I was mentioning the different kinds of plots we can look at. But there are many different types. I honestly don't even know what many of them are, especially these two. So I'm sure that someone here knows what RT60 and GD is, but um, I tend to use waterfall and spectrogram a lot as well as um, SPL. And all SPL is just showing all the frequency response measurements that you've taken in that data set. Um, like here. This would be all this PL, just overlaying the curves on top of each other. After, uh, I want to say maybe 15 to 20 hours of working on this particular set of headphones, um, 
this particular FOSTEX T50 RP set, uh, this was where I'm at right now. The green, I guess I've chosen two colors that are probably not very good, but that is left channel, that is right channel, and this is an average, um, an average of the two. Uh, I, I noticed that this set was laid from the beginning in this, uh, this little dip here. When it was in its stock form, that dip was uh, minus 25 decibels, and I've raised that to a comparable minus 7, minus 8 sort of thing which I feel kind of proud of that I was able to change it that much. Well, keeping the bass and it's fairly flat. Uh, I was sort of going for no more modulation than maybe two decibels or so. It's sort of hard to tell, you know, if I've achieved that. Uh, definitely the channel imbalance is not bad, especially you know, in some of these regions here. Uh, the right channel has a bit of a hump or so this sort of bass and lower mids region. Uh, the bass here actually extends down to 2 hertz. Um, I'm not quite sure how I achieved that. And I don't know if the accuracy falls off as you get lower in your frequency. I'm not quite sure. Uh, there's no real reason to say yet that it would or wouldn't, but again, someone may know more about that. Uh, this is an example of the left channel uh, it's a waterfall plot that just shows the decay of the signal in time in milliseconds up here is milliseconds. Uh, so you can see the, the frequency response and then the decay as time goes on. Uh, this is good to see if you have maybe strange resonances occurring uh, or to make sure that your bass isn't um, rumbling your headphones so much, I guess is a good way to say, which would just be another sort of form of resonance. Um, you want to make sure that everything is, is decaying smoothly. If you have a random, uh, something, a signal that's not decaying, perhaps in the middle of your frequency, that's something you need to address. So that can be useful in that respect. Uh, this is a spectrogram. And the third type of graph that I tend to use, um, it's showing the same, a lot of the same types of things that a waterfall plot can show you. Uh, but it gives sort of a, a different view of your frequency response and where sort of the, the peak of the signal is right in the middle. You can see certain characteristic things that come over, for, him, for instance, this uh, here is here, and another sort of thing that pops out of me is this little guy here. It's showing up uh, right here. Yep. Yeah, right there. Ideally, if you had a perfectly flat headphone or piece of equipment that you measured, there would just be a, a red line that goes all the way through here. And so I guess that's sort of what you could say I'm going with that. Um, and that would just be at zero, dead flat. In this case, there is some that peak a little over zero. So the harsh red points like here and here are showing peaks that are actually above zero. Uh, and then here you just have the uh, decay time in uh, milliseconds again just like uh, here, shown in a 2D version. So you have color as your third z-axis that's in a two-dimensional plane. Um, and sort of uh, some future work I wanted to show you. Uh, these are some pictures that Keith Atkins had sent me. Um, on the left is an Odyssey LCD2 measurement of his pair that he has at home. Uh, he measured these using this exact same setup. And he got something similar to the graph that Odyssey sends you when you buy those headphones. Um, they smooth their curve a little bit more than he does, but uh, they have extremely flat response from 20 all the way till roughly kind of 500, 600, 700. Um, there's some slight little off in the treble, but it's uh, not too bad. It's a very good headphone. It measures very well, especially down here in the lower range. Um, on the right is his pair of Fossex T50 RPs that he just sent off to, uh, I want to say his name is Tal Hertzen. He works for Inner Fidelity and he does, um, I guess you could say, official measurements. He has um, a measuring head and he does, he's written many, many articles on headphones that you can check out online. Uh, these, I mean, he, he's put hundreds of hours in, into this set and they are very, very, very flat. 
there's a contest that actually ends tomorrow. If you send in your set to Tile, then he will he'll measure all of them, and the measurement that's the best or the flattest, he's going to give you a pair of bodies the LCD twos, which is kind of cool. It's like a thousand dollar bonus just for winning a contest. Um, I thought that was pretty cool, and so you know, this is things that I aspire to, or maybe you guys aspire to, with modding headphones for those of you who are interested in doing such like Kevin. Um, it's something to, to try and achieve. Um, I'm not there yet, and I don't think I can get there with this set because of uh, this problem, but uh, maybe in the future. And I've noticed that each set requires its own specific care, you could say, just by looking at the difference in the channels. This was more or less the, the bottom gear was more or less, I think, even the left channel overlay with, uh, this, with the same measurements, or sorry, the same modifications that were applied to the right channel, which is this, the blue curve. And theoretically, they should be the same, but they weren't. And you can see that even from headphones, from different pairs of headphones, that they'll just be completely, they'll measure completely different on the same system, even with the same modifications. It's just the way it works out, uh, the variations in the driver. So it's important to be able to measure these, just to make sure you actually know what you're getting. Um, and I guess with that, that's all I really have. Um, I'm sure this question is tough. How much does it cost for this? Two bucks. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's really cheap. Yeah. How exactly do you buy the headphones? You are sticking various materials in there, um, behind the driver, or, or in the cup volume, or on the cup walls, like acoustic foam. That will give you different changes in frequency response, and the combination of those, along with different amounts of porting in the baffle and the cup vents, closing those ports, opening them, will uh, you know you, you mess around with all those combinations, and you finally get something that works. So are there like different things that affect different frequency ranges? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's uh, I guess if you wanted like a general rule of thumb, if you wanted to like increase treble and take away some of the bass response, you would try and close the headphone from the cup vents, but you could open the baffle port that allows air to go in from your side to the inside of the cup. That's what I found. Uh, but then again, like it's looking at the one thought, oh, where is it? The, that's also converse to the fact I mean, here we were lowering bass by uh, putting holes in the vents. So those general rules only kind of work, sort of. It's, um, it's sort of a tweaking, like small menu changes can make small things that will improve the headphones. Even more so than just saying, okay, I'm going to apply this general rule and I'll sort of get a curve that works. Versus then, okay, now I'll make my new changes and I'll get it to really work. Yep. What did you do to improve the, uh, the dip? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I changed the material on the back of the driver. I added... The driver is sort of like a... I think I might have told you this before, but it's like a... It's sort of like a grid. And usually when you... You're putting like a material on the whole thing. Um, and usually when you put a second layer of material over the center square, it's going to increase the base, but when you put, at least in my, in my theory, when you put that material over the four corners, um, that helped raise the treble the most. That in the combination of opening the port on the baffle side in that channel, um, which is that hole on the baffle where the driver sits on, uh, and closing the cup vents, uh, but tweaking around with the number of holes that are poked in those vents at the same time. Um, and the amount of cotton that was inside the cup. I had to change that amount on each side depending on which, uh, depending on the measurements. Do you try to uh, maintain a symmetry inside the actual, uh, the headpiece, or do you just, you know, try whatever? Usually symmetry works best, yeah. Uh, especially on the driver, actually, it will perform differently if you have, like, uh, if you could think of this as, like, north and south. Not right-handed, right? 
Um, so if you were to put maybe cover this and this with an extra set, uh, extra layer of material, it would measure differently than covering this and this. But covering all four of them might not give you favorable results. So to answer your question, I guess most of the time, yeah. Especially when you're working in like the back of a coffin with cotton, you don't want cotton all on one side of the coffin, you know, open on the other side. But with things like material on the back of the driver, um, sometimes it may be beneficial not to be symmetric completely. Yeah. So when you go on stuff like headroom, um, and and they just have one frequency response, do they just measure like oh, 100 headroom? Uh, well, what they did was probably, at least I'm pretty sure that they were doing something like averaging. Um, where it's, um, you see like the left and right channel, and I took the average, which you can see is sort of the line in the middle. So that's probably what they've done. I don't really know, to be honest. They probably took uh, hundreds of measurements of a type of headphone. I don't know if maybe it was different headphones, or if it was just one and they took hundreds of measurements on it. Either way, that when you get one curve like that, they would either have to tell you it's the left channel or it's the right channel, but it's probably an average. Yeah. And they also, at Headroom, they use uh, like a binaural head, you know, so they're getting really usually rely on those more than you can these because of differences in like when you're sticking the light in your ear, you know, how far you have it in or if it's on an angle or something like that. Yeah. How are you able to these measurements? It seems like if you measure the headphones and drop a lot of it, it would be hard to get the microphone back in the exact same spot that you had it when you took the first measure. I usually keep the microphone in while I'm lying. Oh, okay. I usually keep it in my ear. Um, you can get it back in your ear the same spot, sort of. Um, I guess after after I've been sitting there for a few hours, uh, my ear can kind of feel like where it was sitting. So if I kind of get it back there, it, it usually is pretty repeatable. Um, but it's definitely most repeatable when you just keep it in your ear, modify, do it again, modify, do it again. And then when you want to switch channels, be sure that you're probably done with that channel for the day before you go work on the right side. Then. Right. Have you tried just taking repeated measurements or the DV of each other half the DV? Oh yeah, they're usually right on top of one another. All right. um, you may get some variation depending on your heartbeat in like the lower bass. Uh, I sometimes, if I like pull my breath and then let it out, my heart might be beating stronger, um, and then you'll get some variance. So that's usually something you can throw out. You're probably not gonna see something like this in the bass usually. Yeah, for the most part, I mean, I've been pretty amazed at how repeatable it can be for one person. However, if you were to say, if you were to have two people next to each other with like identical sets that you built, and they each have a microphone in their ear, and you, you give the headphones from one person to the next, those measurements probably won't be as repeatable. Uh, so, it sort of comes up. Is there anything else? How hard would it be to get a mannequin head and just drill a hole and stick the microphone in there? Not terribly challenging. Because then you can repeat the measurements, be more precisely. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Um, What's the thing that binaural head? Well, uh, I, binaural head also has the head transfer function in it, so you can measure both channels at the same time. I think. Uh, how does that work? Do you know something about that too? So I, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about it in a long time. Transfer function of one side to the other side of your head. Yeah, that's what the transfer function is. Um, I mean, usually by normal head, it's partly for recording, so the head transfer yeah. function is sort of knowledge to be able to... Well, yeah, for more like point sources outside, like walking around. But, and, but for calibrating headphones, like a couple of plate would work, which is what yeah. like Dr. Harkin used to do. Well, I don't know. Um, it'd be good to find out. But I think inserting a mic into a head would be, I mean, a would be a cool thing to try. A couple of plates is just a flat, sort of a flat plate you put the headphone here that seals the cup so the microphone's in the plate. Uh, so, um, what can you tell by the head? Well, isn't it like, a, a, isn't like just a thing that you can just stick the microphone on like that? And, and 
that you said, like, that something on that. Yeah. Okay. So it's not modeling the cavity in the air or the cavity the rest of the Well, yeah, this thing is like, there's also, if your ear is sitting in there too, right. and it sort of changes the way that the sounds bounce around in there. Right. Um, I'm just a model. Do a clay model of your ears. Yeah. Um, I guess the way that this is, it's just easy and cheap because it's using free software and a two dollar microphone and the schematic of the power supply is like costs four dollars to order the parts so i guess it's a, like a budget system 